Welcome to Post Viral. As always, we are not medical professionals and we recommend that you speak to your healthcare professional for individualized care. Enjoy the episode. Hello. Hello. Welcome to Post Viral. Hi. How are you, Stu? Yeah, I am doing good. We are back to our baselines. Woo! Yeah, I think we are. I'm so happy you're out of that. Your brain went a little cray cray. Yeah, yeah. I felt like in a, well, yeah, I don't think I have to explain to people (laughs) when you're in a flare up or in a crash. It's not particularly nice, but yeah, we're both back. Yeah, my stomach's all good. We've done some cool things. We went to another coastal city, Campeche. Yeah, a little town for Stu's birthday. We went to another Mayan ruin, climbed another another one, Uxmal. Beautiful, yeah. I was not expecting it to be so cool. And there were so many iguanas. Oh, massive as well, yeah. Komodo dragon size. <laughs> and they told me that they were ancient Mayans, <laughs> reincarnated, <laughs> I swear to God. I didn't hear that bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, back on our feet, so prepare world (laughs) here we come (laughs) here we come yeah so where do we start today we have a listener question yeah we've got a good question actually from laura my friend laura similar to the question we had before surrounding jealousy but with big life events so the example she was talking about is her friends having children almost things like you're left behind of those key life events Mm -hmm. thought it would be a, a good thing to talk about because I'm sure a lot of people are in similar positions and similar situations. Yeah, definitely felt that too. (laughs) A lot of my friends feels like all their lives are going forward with babies and great jobs and marriage and yeah, yeah, 100% same. And I, I think it would be similar to what we said before as you're allowed to feel those feelings like don't try and push them away. If you're feeling sad, if you're feeling jealous, that's fine. And I think it's yeah, really valid and understandable as well. But also, while kind of focusing on what you do have, things you can control. Yeah, yeah. being grateful for sure. Yeah, for me, it's, it's weird to talk about spirituality. But, um, you know, Buddhism has really helped me. It's one of those things I would never say to someone else. There's a purpose to your suffering, of course. And, you know, I question it all the time as well. But believing that there is some bigger reason to your struggle and that in Mm. the end things will work out, it it really helps me at least. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think you never know where life is going to take you just because we're not necessarily following the tried and tested society's view of this is how it should look like. I'm sure when we get to a certain point in our life and look back, we'll think, oh, okay, I now understand the journey I was on and the path I was on a little bit more. But I agree, it's really hard when you're in that situation to hear that and to say that to someone else too. Yeah, Um, it doesn't feel like that most of the time. No, exactly. And so with that, one thing that helps me a lot is being really conscious with what I surround myself with who I surround myself with we're going to talk about support community and environments in one of our episodes coming up so it actually might be that you need to set some firm boundaries if it's social media if it's a certain person that as much as you love them and as much as obviously it's great what's going on for them actually you might just need a little bit of space but yeah really no simple answer and a really tough one So, Harsh and a Critic was one of the personality types before, leading into self-love and brain retraining. Brain retraining, the controversial word. (laughs) We're ready for the hater. I felt like this was such a buzzword that I just didn't get for like a year. What am I missing? What is this brain retraining magical magic pill out there that I'm just not understanding? Maybe if you're listening, you're in a similar boat. Hopefully today we're going to debunk that and really break it down that it's quite simple yeah so brain retraining is just essentially the theory that by changing the patterns in how we think as well as what we think about through repetition uh, and a few other strategies that we're going to discuss today that you can literally change your physical health i think there's just a lot of caveats we have to set out 
We know that with chronic fatigue or other system sensitivity disorders that our nervous systems are affected and we know that there may be other issues at the root of it as well. I think when people hear brain retraining, they think, oh, he's saying I can just change the way I think and I'll get better. Yeah, think your way out of this illness. Yeah, exactly. And it makes people be like, don't tell me I have a mental health disorder. Not that there's anything wrong with mental health disorders. Like, we definitely have aspects of them as well. But this is a, absolutely a neurological issue, yeah, physical. a physical yeah. issue. That's a big caveat. Another one is that toxic positivity that comes along with brain retraining. If you don't understand it correctly, or if you haven't incorporated the stuff that we've talked about in previous episodes, you might be pushing your feelings down while you do it. Yeah, I know you've definitely talked before about how because you jumped to brain retraining it was working for a while but you almost hadn't dealt with a lot of the things under the surface yeah. and so it was yeah the toxic positivity just oh no i'm fine oh no i'm fine but not necessarily dealing with the real stuff yeah exactly and i think because i would say brain retraining can absolutely cure you i do believe that i think it really depends on your background if you have the emotional awareness skills the diet all the things we've talked about are also important elements and this is just another element also then if you if it didn't cure you it can bring up all these emotions of shame and guilt and yeah panic like why is this not working for me it should be it should be it exactly should be. and i definitely had those feelings when i crashed again i was oh it made me so depressed but in the end though i'm still here to recommend it i still do it i think it's really really good i just think yeah. it's one of the pieces yeah sorry we're not being massive downers <laughs> <laughs> no i think i think it's absolutely great i would recommend it yeah going to talk about a range of experiences we've had with it today so ema had asked us a question previously about when you start to get into patterns of fear and thinking the worst is going to happen actually brain retraining is a really powerful tool to catch those thoughts and to train your brain to think differently yeah. okay so before we dive into some of the science and our experiences what can we learn from the animal kingdom about brain retraining, Lindsay? Well, today's animal is, as I'm sure you all saw in the title, <laughs> yeah. the pufferfish. Pufferfish, nice. <laughs> I picked the pufferfish because the pufferfish puffs himself up into a huge ball when he sees a threat. And I was thinking about how it encapsulates the fake it till you make it kind of idea of if you see yourself as it, you become it. Yeah, projecting the version of yourself you want to become. Yeah, just like the idea of power poses. <laughs> like, like him puffing himself up is his power pose. Be afraid of me. So the pufferfish, he can puff himself up to three times his size. There's pufferfish of all sizes, from like tiny, tiny pufferfish to like huge meter large pufferfish wow. is what they can get up to. They're so big, That'd some of them. <laughs> yeah, they take in like a huge amount of air and they bloat themselves up. They also have spines instead of scales. So when they puff up into a ball, all those spines stick directly outwards. So you wouldn't want to chomp into one of those guys. <laughs> like it does not look like a fun thing to eat. So he really, really plays this part of a scary dude. He makes his skin a hundred times more toxic than cyanide. It's so crazy how toxic wow. these animals are. <laughs> so toxic positivity. <laughs> yeah, toxic positivity. Wait a second. Yeah, it could be. It could be toxic if you um, overdo it. I can see that metaphor. Good job. Look at you bringing it in. I hadn't even thought of that. But yeah, so the dwarf pufferfish can choose whether to be male or female. <laughs> they choose their sex. So when they're born, the first one to be born out of the eggs makes the choice. Do I want to be female or male? Wow. Yeah. And the oldest one to have chosen to be male, all the rest after that have to be female. <laughs> <laughs> they don't get a choice yeah, yeah oh, wow. it's actually a choice which is kind of interesting as far as us like choosing the mental state we want to be in 
I'm going to choose to be healthy and manifest into a reality. <laughs> okay, a little bit of we're going to talk about more in this episode. Also, like our friend the octopus, they can choose their color. They can change color either to be darker or lighter, depending on how they need to camouflage into the environment or stick out, depending on which one they're choosing again. So a lot of this choice goes into the brain retraining idea. Yeah, yeah, that, I like that. Yeah. Also things about this toxin that they release to kill other predators is that the toxin communicates with your nervous system. Once it, it gets to you, it particularly affects the connection between your brain and your body. Is it a nerve agent? Yeah, maybe that's a nerve agent. Right. That makes sense. But it just made me think about how our nervous systems are affected and how we're affected by others' nervous systems as well, yeah. by what state other people are in, mm. and how you know we can make choices around how our mental state is. But as humans and as pufferfish, <laughs> we, we have an effect and we're affected. Yeah. Maybe I'm trying to pull too far on the metaphors. <laughs> no, no. And one that I talk about with a lot of the animals, it seems to be, that comes up is that they're also very sensitive, like a lot of us. Very sensitive to water variation. Compared to most fish, they're one of the most sensitive. That's because they don't have scales, they have spines. And it also makes them more at risk of disease. Oh, okay. An interesting similarity to us there, yeah. too. So, yeah, is that all my facts? Oh, no, wait, one more. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> like a chameleon, they can move their eyeballs independently from each other. Oh, wow. And I just thought that was a cute little similarity to us having to be always on the lookout for our harsh inner critic. <laughs> yeah, okay. We're like looking in all directions because we're so used to the way things are and the way our brain works. We really have to be on the lookout for that. Nice, I like that. One eye to the left, one to the right. <laughs> yeah, where's it gonna come up? <laughs> okay, that's it. Yeah, that's great, yeah. Lindsay, you probably have more experience with brain retraining programs than me. So do you want to introduce the overall concept and the science of how it works in our body as you understand it? Yeah, what they've found in more recent years, the more science has gotten into understanding the brain, is the brain is very malleable. Our dear friend, neuroplasticity. So, so neurons that fire together, wire together. Our brain, the more we think in one way, the more our brain is wired to think in that way. And we can, by starting to train our brain, just like you're training your muscles when you're doing physical activity, train your brain to think a different way, your brain starts to pick up those signals and go down that path more easily yeah. through the neurons. Mm. And that becomes your default. Yeah. The way I like to think about it is we are creatures of habit. You know, our episode all about goals and habits, how we're actually the product of our habits. And similarly, our brain is no different. It is always looking for the easy way. And so the easiest way is the tried and tested way, which is whenever I have a slight feeling of pain in my arm, my brain goes, oh my goodness, I've broken my arm. And that becomes the default route. But actually, it doesn't have to be the default route. We can change our brain patterns to be different. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And the part of our brain that has this likely neurological disorder is called the limbic system, mm. which is a reptilian brain. The first part of our brain that formed, really, it's made up of three parts, um, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, and the hippocampus, <laughs> mm. and really controls our fight or flight system. The amygdala sends signals through the hypothalamus, which controls our hormones and our heartbeat. It's all controlled there. It's all the very base of what makes a human <laughs> and because it influences all of the systems in our body the limbic system or this command center <laughs> star star trek reference for you <laughs> if it is impaired it can lead to a huge variety of symptoms as we get with these illnesses and there is theories with chronic fatigue and these nervous system sensitivity disorders that the amygdala is 
in some way acting up has been altered, has been oversensitized, mm. is a good way to think of and it. And what does the amygdala do? So the amygdala, not only does it pick up when there's a fear response and then lead all through the whole system of fight or flight, but it also is involved in creating a memory associated with that fear. Oh, so a pattern. Yeah. Right. So if you, for example, went on a run right now and then you ended up crashing, then every time you go for a run after that, your brain's going to be like, oh, shoot, <laughs> when I run, I crash. It becomes an association and is implanted there. So the theory of brain retraining is the pathways in our brain, which have so keenly been trained to pick up potential threats through exposure, having felt threatened time after time over the years, it's giving us preemptive symptoms because it's trying to protect us because it knows we'll probably go that way. So the amygdala is like the alarm system then? It is. So we may not even know that there's a danger and it's triggered sometimes even before we've cognitively been like, oh, that's dangerous. Oh, amazing. And so then the neuroplasticity brain retraining part is that when these tried and tested routes happen and perhaps we have a particularly sensitized amygdala, we can consciously, like the puffer fish, choose different thoughts that can lead to different results for our nervous system and our amygdala is that right and store it so it's also involved in forming positive memories so nice. once you start that cycle of creating and storing a positive association with an action that's also the work of the amygdala i think it, yeah it makes sense last time when we were talking about chronic stress chronic pressure building up then what we think is normal so a normal response to the example you gave of every time I run I feel awful afterwards that becomes normal but actually it's challenging what we've normalized Robert Collier says one comes to believe what one says to oneself whether that's true or false so yeah whatever we keep telling ourselves, that's truth for us even though it might not necessarily be true and we can create a new truth Exactly, exactly. But there is something biologically different going on with our amygdalas. For example, in the documentary Free Solo, which is the one about that crazy rock climber guy who has like no fear. He doesn't use any straps or anything and he's climbing these mountains. They did scans of his brain and stuff and actually found that his amygdala is smaller than the average amygdala he doesn't have as much of a fear center as most people, which makes sense that he has, he's so incredibly brave (laughs) in like almost a stupid way, to be honest. (laughs) And you could argue, I'm sure they do, is it nature perhaps, or is it actually nurture that he's just trained his thoughts, that his amygdala has shrunk slowly over time because he's comfortable with things that would create fear in other people? Yeah, Mm. I don't know. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, a a book which has really affected me is Dr. David Hamilton's How Your Mind Can Heal Your Body. And if you are interested in, I suppose, like the power of the mind for healing and a lot of the kind of geeky science behind this, I didn't think I necessarily was, but I just loved it, devoured this book. It cites so many studies about the impact of positive thinking and your mind over your physical body. So just a few things he throws out. They did a study on people who others would describe as hostile or stressed. Their wounds healed at 60% of the speed of healthy control groups. People who were negative, they were five times more likely to have coronary heart disease in the coming years than those who were satisfied. And like medication as well, there was a study about antivirals and those who were like committed to positive thinking and less stressed, the antivirals were four times more effective than those who were stressed and negative thinking yeah obviously that's just a snapshot and there's loads more in there i suppose if you're kind of questioning brain retraining as a does this work is there any science to back this up his book is a good place i'd say to start and there's a lot more studies that he can point you in the direction of too yeah and the first place i heard about the science was from phil parker the guy who 
started the lightning process brain retraining program mm. if you go to the lightning process website there's a, about a 15 minute audio you can download for free and in that he gives a bunch of the science already that makes you be like huh i had no idea at that point and when you splurge into the hour one if you want to pay the i think it's like 15 dollars for that audio he talks about how he had put his hand through a window through glass and he had broken some nerves in his hand and he had been told that he would never be able to use his hand again. He'd never be able to play guitar by so many doctors. He went to doctor after doctor because he wanted to hear a different result until he finally found a doctor that said, no, I think you can heal yourself by doing this, like essentially by visualizing it and by doing the brain retraining. And he did it. His hand is totally healed. Amazing. Yeah. If you want examples that are more, maybe more relevant to us, <laughs> So Annie Hopper, who created DNRS, Dynamic Neural Retraining System, <laughs> um, that's the program that I did. <laughs> she had very extreme MCS, um, multiple chemical sensitivity. She has examples of her husband would be upstairs on another level in another room and he'd open like some kind of cleaner or something and uh, yeah. she would scream downstairs from of the pain that wow. it caused in her body. And she ended up sleeping in a tent for oh, years because yeah. she couldn't handle the smells yeah. inside a house. She yeah. recovered fully from brain retraining, hence why she teaches a program on it. And then there's people who've recovered from chronic fatigue using it, such as Miguel Batista, who we've talked about before. Yeah. And he has his own course he just started, um, as well as Dan Neufer, who has the ANS Rewire program. Yeah. He recovered after eight years of chronic fatigue using brain retraining mm -hmm. and has a program. And the first guy, original brain retrainer, Gupta, the Gupta method, he had chronic fatigue as well and uh, recovered using it. Yeah. And I think Alex Howard's program, he wouldn't say it's a brain retraining program and CFS Health as well that we both did. But they definitely there's a lot of elements of mindset work there which is rooted in the same techniques of training your brain to think a little bit differently so yeah should we share some of our own experiences with brain retraining yeah absolutely yeah i suppose the first one i had was actually cognitive behavioral therapy which i did seven years ago and definitely has a bit of a bad rep because the guidelines for CFS for so long were do graded exercise therapy and CBT. <laughs> and that's the only thing that can help you. But I do think that there's a good foundation in CBT and it helped me at least. Mine was actually more related to anxiety, which is why I took it, in that it creates the link between a thought can trigger an emotion, can trigger a physical symptom and then an action off the back of it. And all of these things are linked together. So it could just be oh, I'm going to have a panic attack, the emotion, you just feel dread run through your body, your heart starts pounding so much, your mouth goes dry, all of those symptoms, and then your action off the back of it is to like run away <laughs> from wherever you are. You might be in a place that you deem scary. Um, and that, yeah, I definitely hadn't appreciated until that point that, oh, there is a connection between these things. The bit I didn't get so much from CBT, but others have, is what you can do about it. So the awareness is a great start, but to actually find ways to influence that cycle or that chain of events. Whereas Curable is a cool app that I have used for a, a year or so, which is a pain management app using brain retraining. That's a really nice place to start I think for brain retraining because it's cheap so it cost me about 35 pounds it was half price for a year and what it does is it's an app that creates bite-size education and exercises for you from loads of different brain retraining theory so it will have a bit of Dr. Sano that we've talked about with writing exercises it will have different meditation practices education from Dr. Alan Gordon you just do one exercise a day or a couple a week and they're only like five ten minutes but rather than being an overwhelming like really expensive program you sign up to it's just a way to get little bits of information very simply into your day-to-day -day. so I, I really like that actually and having now come across more brain retraining programs, I feel like I understand them a lot more 
having used Curable before. And then the final one that I thought was pretty good was the DARE response for anxiety that I'm going to run through an example in a second. What about you, Lindsay? Well, so when I was still working and I was sick, my friend's dad, he's a therapist. He works with people with chronic illnesses. And he was like, the only thing that I know of helping people with chronic fatigue is CBT. I didn't understand. I don't think really what CBT was at the time. I thought it was something else. I think it was that instant reaction of, ah, I don't think I have a mental health disorder, you know, like this is a physical illness. So it didn't click at that point that that could help me. Then after I'd stopped working, the first time I went to Thailand, that's when I was put in touch with a girl who had been cured by the lightning process. And um, I bought the book instantly. It's called How to Get the Life You Love Now. (laughs) I've probably read the book at least three or four times. It definitely started me on that path. It helped me a lot, teaching me about emotions like guilt and the personality types of people who tend to get these illnesses. So it got me on that path, but I mean, I came back and I had a big crash and it wasn't quite enough. It wasn't until the next winter, before I was going to go to Thailand again, that my friend and I decided to do the DNRS program together, mm-hmm. really lean into the brainer training. And it was really helpful for me to do it with someone because, you know, for the accountability piece. And can you remember why you chose DNRS? I liked that it was run by a woman. I okay. think yeah, for nice. the price, the way you order the DVDs online, I couldn't really figure out how to do the lightning process. Uh, without being in person. These programs are all very similar. Definitely read Mm. up on all of them and see which one you feel most connection with. What I know now about ANS Rewire, I kind of like the idea of that one better because I just like Dan Neufer. I find him really, he's really relatable. Yeah, Yeah. and he does a lot of recovery interviews with people, not people who've done his program, people who've recovered from all kinds of ways. Yeah, that's a good sign. And he recovered from chronic fatigue, so it relates to me. So for me, I did the six months with the DNRS and I liked that they gave you a six month timeline. They said you have to do these activities, homework they give you for six months. But as I've said before, I was 100% in. I got from like 1,000 steps to 8,000 steps in a few months, killing it. Like all, I was just taking like one little break in the day and otherwise I was just going, eating normally, doing everything back to normal. Wow. And then I had a huge crash when I got back to that little island where I was living. So ever since, it's been hard to get back into that total state of of believing. However, I still do. I do all the exercises still every single day because I do find them helpful. And even though we recommend a holistic approach, and obviously we can't cover everything that a brand new training course teaches here, and I can only speak for DNRS, but I do believe that if you spend the money on one of these programs, you are more motivated to invest your time and your energy to like follow through with them. And they create this environment where you really do believe that you will heal from this. And that was really helpful. I'm excited to hear you're going to give us a DNRS run through an example of some brain retraining. Yeah. So I'm just going to give you the general steps of what you would say to yourself three times a day, plus every time you catch yourself. So if I caught myself being like, oh, I'm so dumb, you got to catch yourself. What you would do, it's a whole little spiel. So it starts with a stop, stopping the pattern, right? So you physical a physical gesture of like stop 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 <laughs> Lindsay's doing crossed arms right now <laughs> <laughs> yes i am stopping myself and then you're recognizing what's happening i know what you're doing limbic system <laughs> i know what's happening i know you're trying to protect me also recognize that it's trying to protect you so is it just thoughts or is it let's say you woke up and you're like oh i feel terrible that would be something that you're like no stop Is it physical sensations and symptoms as well as thoughts or just thoughts? Yeah, definitely physical sensations as well. So also that fear response. Say you're starting to go for a walk and you're like, oh my God, what if I overdo it? You do stop or you wake up and you start feeling your lymph nodes because you're like, oh, not again. Yeah. 
it's accepting that symptoms will be there. They will over time dissipate, truly believing they'll pass over time, mm. but you're changing the thoughts you're having. I remember Miguel saying that every time he recognized and stopped, he would give himself a candy sweet or something. Yeah, because he was like, well done, pat on the back. I noticed what I was doing, brain. <laughs> yeah, a reward system, which you yeah. talked about with the uh, habits. But that's the kind of thing where, again, you can argue a little bit of toxic positivity. Because if you're having a bad day, should you let yourself have a bad day? You know. So you stop, you recognize what's happening, you talk to your limbic system like, thanks for protecting me. Be like, I know what you're doing, but I don't need you to do that anymore. I'm actually okay. And then you make a choice. Instead, what am I going to choose to be? So instead, I choose to be confident that my body is healing Mm. i choose to feel energized i choose to feel calm you're in the present moment what are you choosing to feel so it's kind of like again that puffer fish manifesting your destiny of like i am this not i'm going to be this Mm. i am this because even though you could argue that the situation hasn't changed at all your reality maybe has changed because of your mindset around it yeah yeah exactly and over the time you will become it cool. the more and more you do activities that go along with it yeah. right and then the last step is the visualization which we're going to talk about more in a little bit mm. and i suppose yeah it's almost like choosing to put your body into that healing state the rest and digest as opposed to flight state or freeze and that will have a positive impact on your body and healing over time i often hear it talked about healing isn't necessarily a symptom free it's just not being affected by the symptoms which i think there's like an element of truth to that if you are in that mindset of like getting on with life not focusing on the symptoms all the time actually the symptoms do slowly very slowly <laughs> disappear and dissipate and obviously i'm not there so this is more just what i've gleaned from what i've read and other people but i feel like when i've been in that mode in life that started to happen exactly and it's a bit of a balance right like you still need to work up slowly because it's not just like you can be like okay i'm fine now mm-hmm. and your nervous system all of a sudden will reprogram itself we said about working out a practice so it takes time you got to build slowly Oh, that's cool. That's great. Shall I give an example of the DARE response? Because it's a bit different, DARE. It's by Barry McDonough, and it's geared for anxiety as opposed to chronic fatigue. It's a brain retraining method, so I think it can apply to whatever your situation is. DARE stands for diffuse, accept, run towards, and engage. So let's say I've suddenly started to have these panicky anxiety thoughts. I have to give a speech in a work situation or just I'm going into a shop and I'm feeling quite anxious. So diffuse is interesting. It's to ask yourself, so what? What is the worst that can happen now? And so for me, the worst is like, well, I could start crying in a meeting because that's actually happened to me before at work. But then even then it's like, so what? So they'll think, what's wrong with Stuart? Are you okay? (laughs) What is going on here? So what? Just diffuse the situation. It's a way to almost remind yourself and your body, the worst that can happen is this. I'm not going to die here. The second one is accept. So accepting what am I feeling right now? Where am I feeling it? What are the thoughts I'm having? What are the sensations? So is it I'm having a rapid heart, nausea in my stomach, my mouth has gone dry, I can't get my words out because tears are welling up. That would be the accept part. The next one, ah, I think is really good. It's run towards. So this is quite different to other programs I've seen. And that is particularly with panic attacks. And it seems so counterintuitive, but it's saying run towards the sensations and the anxiety saying, bring it on. Okay, I've got a pounding heart right now. Can I feel it more? Come on, speed up, get worse. Do your worst anxiety. Can that be even more intense, even more intense? Which obviously the first time you do it is very scary. And he really suggests trying to do it in like as safe spaces and scenarios as possible to get yourself comfortable with it. But if you do it once and then you get to the space, oh yeah, what is the worst that's going to happen here? It's not actually getting that much worse now you start to get comfortable with 
the sensations and the things that happen and it creates that new reality and those new neural pathways that remind yourself and your amygdala this is it this is the worst that can happen you know, i'm not going to pass out and so then you get a lot more confidence and you create new neural connections and then the last one is engage it's not distraction but it's you've gone through the dar and you're now like i'm going to get back to what i was doing before because particularly with anxiety i find you can get into a cyclical thought process where you're like okay i've diffused i've accepted i've run towards it's still there i'm going to diffuse i'm going to accept i'm going to run towards you kind of keep having that self talk the engage is right i'm going to get back to speaking on the podcast or i'm going to talk to this shop assistant now whatever it is to engage with it and it's not going to be a you do it once and you're healed it's amazing but it's a slowly and surely over time this method has helped hundreds of of people he's worked with and it's the the best method he's seen to heal his own anxiety and for, for other people as well and i find my anxiety far more manageable now and i do think of all the things that i've engaged with over the years it's been the most effective for for me at least Yeah, I definitely see how it can work a lot for anxiety. Mm -hmm. In terms of actual chronic fatigue symptoms, I'm not sure how it would work. Well, I can see how it would work if it's you're diffusing. So what? What's the worst that can happen right now if these symptoms are feeling awful? And I look at them, I accept them, and then I like really pay attention to them. On the Curable app, actually, in lots of pain meditations, they ask you to really focus in on where the pain is and be like come on grow even bigger grow even bigger and actually you're like oh no it's it's still there as it is and then engaging you're like okay well i'm going to get back to my day which similarly to dnrs nothing's really changed but your attitude has and so hopefully you will have a better reality and a better day because of it yeah i don't think it would be run towards in terms of physically go running or engage as in now i can do anything (laughs) it's within your energy envelope whatever you're day-to-day looks like yeah yeah that makes sense Mm. cool yeah it's definitely different for sure so now we're going to talk about some other aspect of brain retraining teaching ourselves about loving kindness and how to better show ourselves self-love and the second part is the visualization which does go along with the spiel but we're going to get more in depth into it Mm -hmm. and then the third one journaling is a very important Mm -hmm. part of it And they're all, yeah, all tools that we incorporate into our day-to-day. Cool. So hit us with loving kindness. What does that look like for you? I think it's really, really important that changing the way you think about yourself and talk to yourself is just as important as all the rest of the catching yourself. Just as important because a lot of us, i.e. me, (laughs) have spent our entire life being so hard on ourselves and so mean to ourselves I don't know if it's a real study, but I think a lot of us have heard this stat that like 20 nice things being said about you or to you is about the same as one negative thing in terms of how quick our brain picks it up and processes it. Right. If you think of like a comment section on a social media, people can say all these nice things, so many great nice things, but if there's one negative yeah. comment, what's the thing you remember? That's what you're going to focus. Yeah. So, what we have to do is really pound it into our brains. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> as true. intense as that sounds, of how amazing we are, how wonderful we are, how much we love ourselves and how much we deserve mm-hmm. love. I know it sounds cheesy and it doesn't feel natural to be like, I love you, Lindsay. You're doing a great job. I'm so proud of you. But actually, it's really what we need. I definitely still need to practice it more. Like, (laughs) it's so many years of negative self-talk that's easier said than done. (laughs) And you you really like loving kindness meditations, don't you? Yeah, Tara Brock, a Buddhist teacher. She's huge on loving kindness meditations. Every second episode of her podcast is meditation. She also has ones on the Insight Timer. You can find her there. It's essentially a guided meditation, sending love to ourselves, to others, to the world. It just feels really nice. And as we talked about in the last episode, the RAIN, which is a really good strategy for processing emotions, when you're retraining your brain, always incorporate the self-love. The last letter of RAIN is nurture 
recognize, allow, mm. investigate, and nurture. And the nurture is really, really important. So no matter how you've reacted or done in that situation, just saying like, oh, well done, that was really hard. Being empathetic to yourself and compassionate to yourself, yeah. Yeah, and really, really being proud of yourself when you do something that was hard. Another thing you can do, which Stu and I both do, I have a mantra. He has an affirmation. <laughs> you can call it whatever you want. Mm. A daily spiel, I'm going to use the word again, that you say to yourself, specifically talking yourself up, what you see yourself being. It's just so lovely. We've got an example of that later. Yeah. <laughs> Aubrey Graham on YouTube, she's got a really nice 10 minute, today is going to be a good day mantra affirmation, which I used to listen to quite a lot because it's just... It just keeps repeating to yourself with really nice atmospheric music. Today's going to be a good day. So even if you wake up thinking, oh, today is going to be a crap day, <laughs> you surround yourself with that and you just can't help but be G'd up by her a little bit. But I mean, you should say too, like loving kindness can be when you're feeling rough, doing nothing and saying, yeah. I shouldn't do anything today. I need to respect how my body is feeling. I love myself enough to just say, can't do that if I've made plans. I need to, to rest and recuperate. Yeah. When I'm in a crash, I don't do my routine. I, I'm like, no, no yeah. if just today is just a rest day, a take care of me to get day. So yeah. all these things, if they feel like Ooh, pressure, it's not worth it. Yeah. When I noticed that I was going, oh, I should, I shouldn't be doing this and really like chastising myself that chastising actually has a huge effect on our nervous systems. Yeah. So the next one, visualization, Dr. David Hamilton, his book, some of the visualization studies they've done, are unbelievable. So they did a study which looked at muscular exercise for those who physically couldn't exercise because they'd had an injury. But imagining doing the exercise and they found that those who were actually exercising the same amount of time each day their muscles grew 53 percent in density over six weeks but those that just imagined it they grew 35 percent from just visualizing the activity and the exercise it grew that much which i don't know i still now i'm like really no it's really? hard to really believe <laughs> the one i heard specifically was sit-ups the muscles in your stomach they got, yeah, one group to do sit-ups every day for two months mm -hmm. and one group to visualize themselves doing sit-ups. And the results were almost the same as far right. as wow. how much muscle in their stomach was developed, which is crazy. Wow. Yeah, yeah. He does say you need to have some controls in place, like the same amount of time doing it each day. You need to know what you're visualizing, the right exercise, the right movement. He talks about how he was rubbish at tennis, bottom of fourth division. And then he started visualizing trying to serve better, but it wasn't really having any sort of impact. He then watched Andy Murray serve a hundred times a day and then visualized himself serving like Andy Murray a hundred times a day. And then he went from like the fourth division to the top of the top division or something in a crazy amount of time just from watching someone else and then visualizing him doing that off the back of it. Yeah, so you do need to know what you're trying to achieve through visualizing. The book talks about different health ailments, like chronic fatigue is in there, and different visualizations you could do. It talks a lot about immune system studies, patients who had visualized their immune system cells. After a month, they had increased 17%, then up 30% by month two, 38% by month three, and they were just visualizing like these cells growing in their body, then going around like Pac-Men eating up all the bad cells. So it's not like it doesn't have to be the exact same representation, but it's got to be the um, mechanism of what you want to achieve and what you want to happen. I used to visualize a lot when I took supplements, visualizing the supplements being absorbed into different parts of my body and changing my body from red inflamed into like a calm blue of nice stars everywhere yeah which was really nice yeah i've definitely visualized like my killer t cells like oh, yeah. punching all the bad <laughs> nice. bad guys in my <laughs> immune system yeah. vacuum cleaners go around sucking up <laughs> yeah you can do. lately i've been visualizing my amygdala glowing and being healthy and oh, nice. working yeah. correctly 
And um, I also like, I really feel like there's a problem for me to get getting oxygen to my brain. So I like to visualize those pathways up through my neck into my brain being filled with air. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think there is something to the consistency and the amount of time and the belief. Yeah, the thing that they teach you in the brain retraining courses for your visualizations is that you want to be in the experience. So in DNRS, you do a past visualization and a future one where you see yourself in six months. They really do have that time limit of 15 to 20 minutes. You should be in this visualization, which is hard to do. So set a timer. Another important factor is using all five senses. You want to visualize what are you smelling? What are you seeing? What colors are you seeing? What do you feel with your fingers? What are you hearing? You hear the birds, you yeah. hear the, the wind. Smell is a very, very powerful sense. If you're smelling, you know, good food, you're smelling the trees at the top of the mountain, mm. you can really, really bring yourself there with smells, especially yeah. I find. And that's a good point, actually. Make it fun because naturally, if you start using your senses, so smelling, tasting, I don't know, maybe I just really like food, but <laughs> <laughs> visualization should be fun and enjoyable. So it should be climbing to the top of that cliff you've wanted to for so long, or I actually visualize having a, a recovery party and it's going to be roller disco <laughs> with all my friends there, all my like favorite songs blaring out, going round. So that's obviously really fun to like lie there and think about that it shouldn't be a uh, forcing yourself to do these things it should be something you enjoy doing and bringing the senses into it definitely helps with that yeah and what they recommend in the programs and and i recommend as well is to write a list you can do it of past memories that made you ecstatic they call it this tingly feeling where you feel it all over your body You're so so happy and so so there make a list of past experience when you felt that for me when i hugged a gray whale the whale came up to our boat that's probably the most amazing experience of my entire life and i see myself hugging that whale and then make a list of where you want to see yourself in six months for me it's visualizations of hiking as we say i'm reaching the top of that mountain mm. i'm doing a yoga teacher training course I'm at my friend's wedding and dancing and socializing. Look for the tinglies and stay in it. And the last thing on vision, something I think both of us have. Do you have a vision board as well up in your room? I do, yeah. Yeah, I love my vision board. I think that was from CFS Health. They suggested pictures of things you love, things you love doing, mantras and affirmations, Bible verses, Buddhist sayings, you know, whatever spirituality you have too getting it all up into one place is a really fun creative exercise to do cutting and sticking you could do it with your children maybe chuck it all on there and have it up somewhere that you see day to day just to yeah reaffirm where you're going encourage you it's just yeah just very nice <laughs> And then the last one is journaling, either at night or in the morning. Some people do both. For me, I've never been able to do it in the morning. I'm, I'm a before bed journaler, personally. Yeah, it's a good habit to get into. Remind yourself what went well today. Yeah. Five things. What went well today, write them down every day. Focus on that. Who are you thankful for? What are you thankful for? Yeah, it's a really good habit because... I don't know, as you're saying earlier, naturally you'd be like, eh, this happened today. Eh, that. Yeah, when I first journaled when I was sick, it was all, oh, such a terrible day. I yeah. felt like this. I feel like this. And this is good to do alongside the Sano journaling we talked about last time, actually, because then you've got the vent, vent out that anger while also, oh, it's not all that bad. <laughs> yeah, just program your mind to look for gratefulness. And I'll hit you with one last Dr. Hamilton stat. Positive thinking and gratitude increases oxytocin, which accelerates stem cells to transform into the healing cells we need quicker. So gratitude is medicine. <laughs> yeah, it definitely changed my life a lot when I started focusing on gratitude. So time for your poem. Oh, wait, it's not a poem today. No, so in honor of brain retraining and affirmations, as we talked about earlier, 
I thought I would read through some of my daily affirmations I do when I'm stretching or lying down. Hopefully it will inspire you to write your own or yeah. Or take his. Yeah, take mine. Yeah. And um, speak them over you. I'm going to say the affirmation and then you can either say it out loud back at me or you can repeat it in your head. But yeah, speak it over yourself. Yeah, I really like have liked when we've done it together. Yeah, we've done it uh, together in Mexico. And then Lindsay's DNRS as well. It's good fun. I am healthy, vibrant and filled with energy. I am enough just as I am. Confident, carefree and at ease. I am enough just as I am. Confident, carefree and at ease. I am learning to love, forgive and accept myself. Getting to know my body, my mind, my soul and my emotions. I am learning to love, forgive and accept myself. Getting to know my mind, my body, my soul and my emotions. And I am healing little by little every day. My immune system and body are getting stronger. I am healing little by little every day. My immune system and my body are getting stronger. Where I can feel it, I can heal it. Where I can feel it, I can heal it. I welcome abundance, joy and good things into my life today. I welcome abundance, joy and good things into my life today. For today is an adventure. I make the most of every opportunity, pausing to enjoy life. Today is an adventure. I make the most of every opportunity, pausing to enjoy life. And I am kind, caring deeply for myself, for others, the world and my impact on it. I am kind, caring deeply for others, myself, the world and my impact on it. I thank God for all the people and good things in my life. I name them now. And I am safe in my body. I dial down the pain in my brain and welcome in safety. I am safe in my body. I dial down the pain in my brain and welcome in safety. On what level of anxious discomfort am I willing to accept today in order to heal? What level of anxious discomfort am I willing to accept today in order to heal? Today, I am becoming the person I am proud of. Today, I am becoming the person I am proud of. And that's your lot. <laughs> Yay! You don't have to have, I think that's 12 or I'm not sure it's a lot. You can have one, you can have however many you want, whatever um, feels good for you. Yeah, it can totally be, make it your own and yeah. Well, yeah, thanks so much for listening, everybody. Kind of broken down brain retraining if you weren't sure about it. And even if you were, you've done one of these programs or you're an expert, that we've introduced some new thoughts or like practices. Good reminders. Yeah, as always, we'd love to hear what resonates, what you think is rubbish. <laughs> yeah, tell us your thoughts. Definitely. Email us, postviralpodcast at gmail.com or our Instagram, postviralpodcast. And we'll be onto the final personality type next time, which is people pleaser, talking about values and boundaries. Oh, yeah. People pleaser. <laughs> Lindsay's like, are we? <laughs> we knew that. It's all planned. Don't worry. <laughs> My brain. Yeah. Thanks for listening and love you all. Tune in next time. Bye. Bye.